Okay, everyone, uh, it looks like we're live. Let me know, uh, type one, if uh, you can see and hear me well. Uh, Clive Clive will be on uh, later on. He's coming on in about 10, 10 12 minutes. Um, those of you who are watching this uh, recorded, <laughs> you uh, might want to jump 10 minutes forward because uh, I usually just have a chat first. Uh, I started a little earlier and I have a chat with uh, everyone on the uh, yeah on the chat. Everyone that's been waiting. Uh, I, I saw a, a question earlier today when I set up the live stream because the uh, the title of the live stream is "Is it the right time to buy government bonds?" question mark And someone said, "Why would you want to support the government by bo buying their bonds?" Um, I agree with that. I personally wouldn't, uh, especially uh, with what our present governments are doing in the West right now. Uh, buying government bonds is uh, like financing <laughs> uh, bad action. But be as it may, uh, I think a, a lot of people out there are getting lured in, into government bonds <laughs> just because the yields are going up. And I think that's a dangerous thing. And we want to try to wake people up. So I'm not saying that uh it's a good thing uh, uh, and we're going to look into that and i thought clive would be a good guy to talk to because he was a wealth manager for for decades he's retired now and uh, i'm sure he's got his uh, opinions on that uh chris conman says hello hi chris bca smith says hello as well brady girding is here steve dent from new zealand uh Quilud charlie Uh, we've got David Weffel, <laughs> Maneco Rules. We, we got uh, num people are typing one. That's good. Uh, Pablo Pina's here. Olivier Leroy is here. Real estate is plunging also in France. Yeah, uh, we're going to look into that as well, and not particularly uh, commercial real estate. I think that's a big problem. Uh, Pablo Pina and Enduro Rama is here. Urban som Sombrero. So yeah, we're going to look into, is it the right time to buy government bonds? We're going to look into a, a lot of other topics as well. And uh, of course, you can ask questions, ask Clive uh, questions as well, uh, of course. Let's see, uh, he's still not here. But anyway, uh, Jiddu the Voice from the Netherlands. Jane D. R. from North Wales, Anton Spoey from Bratislava, Slovakia, Pablo Pina, Cupid Stunt, Evening Mario and Rudy. Yeah, Rudy, uh, he's around but not in here. He's, I think he's outside. It's been quite hot today. It's been a hot day. I think it's going to cool down a little bit this coming week. Um, and uh, one other thing we're going to look into is the uh, CPI data in the UK because uh, they, they've they tinkered with it uh, as of May last year. They've readjusted everything, and I've spoken about that. We're going to look again into that today because that, that's very important in terms of uh, investing in bonds if you're going to invest in bonds. Uh, Billy Ingram from Australia, Bobby Critter, Leo Singh from Australia. Oh, Clive is here already. That's good. All right. He, uh, we'll just wait for him to uh, come on. Stacy Yoder from uh, Cal Canada or, Ca yeah, Canada, I guess, or California. Uh, Gillian B from Perthshire. Scotland, Gerolji. Hi, Gerolji. 70 degrees up in Norway. Oh, hi, uh, Clive. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. Good. Yeah, I, I've been uh, just having uh, saying hello to all the uh, the viewers that the, the, I usually start a little earlier and say hello to everyone and then we, we get on. But as you're here, maybe we can get on uh, with the, the topics. Uh, 
well, Tristan Jones is saying, made an interesting observation today. Uh, base rate in UK, as you know, has been raised to 5%, and the average annualized FTSE return since 1984 has been 5.3% could be pivotal moment for us. Uh, I'm not sure what to make about the FTSE uh, return and, and the uh, base rate. Clive, any any thoughts on that? Um, I, I saw an article today about the government wanting to encourage pension funds to put more, more money into equities. Um, uh, and I think equities in the UK are relatively cheap, but uh, as always, they're they're risky. Um, you know, the rest of the world stock markets have gone up quite a lot. Uh, the UK has kind of been left behind. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't mind buying some UK equities at this at this point, but I probably wouldn't be leaping into government bonds despite the uh, record yields over the last decade being seen this week. Yeah, and the other thing as well, uh, you're talking about the uh, government uh, wanting to encourage. Uh, I think it's public pensions, defined benefit and company pensions. They're trying to get them to actually invest in risk here, uh, uh, equities, private equity. And and, uh, and I saw this a few weeks ago. Uh, Tony Blair, he's got a foundation and someone in that foundation wrote a paper about that. And also to, to put money into the green revolution and all this stuff. Uh, and I think that's dangerous. I think... Uh, um, but uh, if people work for the public sector or they work for companies that have a final or defined benefit pension, uh, I, I think it's uh, you got to be careful, uh, especially when uh, the Tony Blair Foundation and the government uh, <laughs> is thinking of doing something. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think I'd be putting money into or voluntarily into anything that the government was trying to uh, select because there's going to be a political agenda and whatever they do. Um, so, you know, if you have a large, reputable organization doing the investing for you, um, they're probably going to make fairly wise decisions. It doesn't mean to say they'll make money, but they're going to do their best, whereas the government might be influenced by political means and say, OK, we've got to pump a lot of money into startup companies, even though many of them have little chance of success. Um, so from my perspective, I think I'd be cautious if the government's managing my money. Um, but if it's a uh, private enterprise with a lot of experience uh why not yeah i think uh the government isn't saying they're going to take your money and manage it or i think they're trying to push the people that you think are responsible into <laughs> thinking about doing that so i would be careful because they they also in the last couple of decades not just in the uk but in europe and the us they've forced a lot of uh pensions to invest in government bonds. And that has been disastrous in the last year and a half. Yeah, I don't see that going away. The government's going to want people to invest in government bonds because that's how you fund the government. Uh, the governments need more money. And if we look at the way the uh, spending is going to go, they're going to need a lot more money in the future. So someone's going to have to stump up that cash. And I guess they'd like the pension funds to do it. Yeah, and uh, I just want to share... Uh this uh, story here which is kind of uh why i wanted to talk about is it the right time to put your money in government bonds and i i think that's a bit worrying because retail investors many of them don't even realize that um, the price of bonds uh, goes down when interest rates and yields go up and that uh, if interest rates keep rising uh, a lot more in the next 12 to uh well, next year or two, their capital could be decimated, you know, could, well, could be cut quite, quite significantly. And uh, I think they're lured into this um, sense of that, well, it's, it's safe, it's government, uh, it won't go bust, and it's yielding four or five percent. Uh, I think uh, this could be the next <laughs> uh, thing that hurts retail investors. What, what do you think, uh, Clive? I think I think people were quite excited by the two-year government bonds, which last week had a yield over 5%. Um, and on Friday, it was the highest yield in decades. Uh, that obviously means anyone who bought those bonds on Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, or Monday are now losing money. Um, 
but not much. But uh, if you buy a two-year government bond, you're going to get repaid in two years. So, um, yeah, you might find that 5% wasn't what you could have had. Uh, right. But then in two years, you're going to get your money back and you can reinvest it at whatever the going rate is if the pound st is still around. I think most people take the view that uh, whilst mm. we could have a government reset at any time, a currency reset, um, probably we're good for another two years until the CBDC is up and running. Yeah, and someone asked a question, Clive, uh, well, made a comment, why would you want to finance the government by go buying government bonds? And I, I personally, uh, for me, I, I wouldn't invest in government bonds out of principle either because I'm not happy with what the UK government is doing. So there's that as well. People well, when I saw the, um, the the question about bonds, I, I brought along something that one of my ancestors probably invested in. Yeah, uh, I, I found it in, a, in an attic. It's a a Chinese government bond <laughs> issued in 1913, and mm -hmm. it's repayable at my option in mm -hmm. 1960. Apparently, yeah. uh, repayable at my option in sterling. This yeah. is a 20 pound bond, by the way, or in marks, that's German marks, or in francs, in French francs, or in rubles, or in yen. So basically, I will have an option to get, uh, um, for my 20 pounds, I could get uh, 505 francs, or 20 rubles, or 20 pounds, or 409, uh, I don't know what currency that one is, or 409, uh, uh, what is it? Marx, I guess it is. But Was basically, I've got prior five... to the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, I guess. Uh, Nineteen thirty. Oh, Chinese well, China. Sorry, yeah. China. Yeah. So, if you look at page two, the coupons. The coupons. When, I, when I was young, uh, we used to have coupons on the bonds. We used to we used to cut them off and yeah. take them down to the bank and get paid in cash. Looks like they uh, got uh, one coupon paid, and then then they uh, didn't get. Any yeah, they paid. Uh, what, well, it looks like they paid one, two, three, four. Five coupons have been paid. Yeah. And the last, so the coupon here is, which didn't get paid, is dated 1st of July, 1929. Uh, yeah, first, no, 1939. So mm. since these bonds were issued in 1913, it looks like they paid. Oh, they paid for about 26 years. Yeah, there's probably a few pages of these coupons. Yeah. So the last coupon was paid 1939. And yeah. the, the one which has not been paid or the very, very latest coupon would be 1960 up here. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so I'm thinking one day I should write off to the government of China and ask if they want to give me my 20 pounds back. Um, yeah. And if I value that today in gold, because this is a gold bond, it would be worth about eight or 9,000 pounds. Well, I've got a German uh, government international 5.5% loan, 1930. And- you uh, they'll honor that? Well, they, they pay the, the coupons, as you can see here. All the way till uh, May 1945, which is uh, interesting. Or oh, sorry, December 1944. Mm -hmm. uh, so they and then so after the war ended, it's ironic that after the war ended, they defaulted on it. But during the war, uh, the German government was paying U uh, U.S. and uh, for foreign investors. They were paying them, and they probably were doing it through the BIS, of course, but. What and, currency was it in? Uh, in U.S. dollars. Ah, so okay. yeah, it's a thousand dollar, and it's payable in gold, of course, as well, mm -hmm. because it was issued in 1930. But I, I think uh, after 1933, uh, I'm not sure if they still paid in gold because Roosevelt, uh, he, uh, you know, suspended gold or made it illegal. But it says principal and interest payable at the office of J.P. Morgan and Co. in the borough of Manhattan, city of New York. So, yep. <laughs> so uh, on, on this Chinese note, I could turn up at any one of six banks in six countries in Japan, uh, mm. UK, France, Germany or Moscow and get paid. And of course, China. But I think, the, you know, this just goes to show even under a, a gold standard, a sound money system, government bonds are not really safe because they can just renege on it. It's just it's a promise. And nowadays uh, it doesn't even ha it's not even backed. The currency is not even backed by anything uh, solid. 
So uh, aside, f- so that's why I think they they might not renege on payments, but they'll just dilute it away. Could you explain to the viewers how how they dilute the purchasing power of the bonds? Because uh, I made a comment on in that uh, FT article because you can comment, and I said, yeah, you might be getting four or five percent, but the uh, CPI is still almost nine percent, RPI is eleven, so you're actually losing a lot of purchasing power. Um, so throughout my life, people have you been using the word inflation to mean the general rise in prices, but by my definition of inflation. Inflation historically used to be the inflation of the money supply, the symptom of which was rising prices. Um, And obviously, as Britain devalued or came off the gold standard, uh, they could print money willy nilly, and that led to more money and it led to rising prices. Um, So that's the first point. Um, But the question is, how, how do how does inflation happen? How does money come into existence? Well, when the government runs out of money and they more often than not have a budget deficit, that means they spend more money than they collect in taxes, they have to borrow the money from somewhere. So they can borrow it from the public at large, which basically withdraws the money from circulation, and then the government spends it, the money's back in circulation, not too much effect if the public lends it. But over the decades, the central bank in the UK, the Bank of England and the USA, the um the federal reserve and nowadays in europe it's the um ecb over the decades the central banks have tended to buy quite a lot of the government debt because the government can't always borrow from the public because sometimes the public's got indigestion and doesn't want to buy anymore or they don't want to sell it to the public because it will raise interest rates and that will slow the economy and the government's trying to stimulate the economy so the central bank will buy that debt but to buy it the central bank has to print the money so what we get is a if we is a situation where the central bank is printing money to buy debt from the government which the government then spends and that money is now in circulation increasing the supply of money which means everybody's got more of it and that's what happens that what causes inflation because people having more money in their pockets start to bid up the prices um now that's been going on for uh, well, ever since we had paper money um, and continues to this day. In the olden days, the supply of goods and services was much more limited. So um, as they printed money, it had a much more profound effect on the retail prices. But these days, the effect is a little less profound because a lot of that surplus money can find its way into other things like the stock market or works of art. This is why um, if the Van Gogh comes on sale, um, half a half a billion dollars is not a surprising price anymore uh, for a bit of canvas and paint. Because someone out there, you only need two people with a lot of money to want it, and the price could be right up in the sky. Uh, and so we've seen the price of rare and unusual and desirable goods and works of art go to the go to the moon thanks to the huge amount of money printing uh, but all that money is sitting out there uh waiting for its day to be spent and the danger we've got is if a lot of this money all decides it wants to be spent quickly um we're going to have rapidly rising prices of everything because people will be rushing down the shops to buy anything they can the shop shelves will be empty and uh yeah that, then the it's time for the reset yeah, and I think uh, the way you think is the way, uh, not the way I learned it originally, because at university, uh, they teach Keynes in economics, and you think that uh, uh, inflation is the CPI. But I, I'm afraid a lot of economists uh, on Wall Street, in the city, uh, central banks, uh, at gov- in governments, they look at inflation as the CPI, and they're all saying, oh, no, don't worry, it's going to come off. But they don't realize that you've had this increase in the money supply, this inflation for, well, ever since 1971, but especially ever since 08, 09. And I agree with you. And I think uh, uh, Cantillon, I don't know if you heard of the Cantillon effect, you know, uh, they, they've been lucky, the central banks, since uh, 08, that a lot of this new money is flown into financial assets. But now it's starting to flow into all the things that people need to survive. And that's politically really uh, hard. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what we're seeing now, that the Bank of England has got a problem. They need to raise rates. But at the same time, 
the electorate has uh, up to here with mortgages. And, and uh, I, I think they've already started, uh, uh, Clive, tinkering with the numbers. And I spoke about this. Uh, actually, it was July last year. And uh, because I, I've been looking at the Bank of, England, Bank of England inflation calculator for quite a few years. And I noticed uh, back in July last year that uh, the numbers changed because uh, I'd al I always look after 1914 because that's when uh, World War I started and they d suspended the gold standard. They went back in the 20s, but it wasn't really a, a, too much of an effort. So uh, here we see that last year, uh, if you put a pound in 1914, you'd need 78 pounds 53. Uh, or an inflation average, a CPI of 4.2% a year. And, and when I saw that last year, I thought, this this seems uh, lower than I thought. And thankfully, I found one of my videos I did the year before where, where, where I said inflation in Britain has been permanent over a century. And look at this. So a pound in 1914 uh, in 2020 costs 118, 4.6%. They've gone from being 4.2% to 4.6. So they've tinkered with the number. Uh, the other thing they did, Clive, is because you probably remember in 1997, the Bank of England was given independence and uh, they were given a 2% CPI or inflation target. And every time that uh, the, the Bank of England had the uh, CPI, 1% above target, they had to write a letter to the government uh, to say why. <laughs> but as you can see, back in uh, June 2021, uh, since they became independent, the average CPI was 2.7. So they missed the target completely, right? And it might not seem a lot, but 0.7 over 23 years is a big, big uh you know, you can maybe talk about that, seeing that you did wealth management and you know how much uh, a kind of percentage makes a difference over the long term. But notice that now, and this was all uh, tinkered with on May in May 2022, they've changed the methodology. Notice that now the Bank of England magically only uh, had a 1.9% inflation over the period where they had 2.7 before. So I would say even the uh, data that we have now, the uh, CPI, which dropped to 8.7, that's still probably more like uh, 10%. What, what do you think? Uh, well, one of the measures I use is the price of my very first flat, which I bought in uh 1978 um and i paid 12 and a half no i paid thirteen thousand pounds uh in that year and i think it would sell for 20 times that probably two hundred sixty thousand pounds today um in fact i did walk past it uh last year and i i think i saw another one identical on the same block for two hundred fifty thousand. um so that's you know, uh, I have I can't do the mathematics in my head on that one, but I think it's a lot more than four or five percent inflation um, since 1978. Um, well, I think about that, uh, Mario. I remember that um, when I bought this flat for thirteen thousand, I actually could borrow twelve thousand pounds back then. And uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is a lot of people are now talking about the, the pain which will be suffered by people due to the mortgage rates going through the roof. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a disaster for people in England because interest rates have just tripled, um, where people are going to be finding their outgoings are three times what they were before. And it's going to be very, very hard on those who have high mortgages relative to their salary. Um, now, Back then, you could borrow two, two and a half times your salary. So I was on about £4,800. They would lend me £12,000. Uh, that was kind of the maximum I could get for a £13,000 house or flat, actually, one bedroom. Um, and that was consuming, um, if I do the maths, uh, I think I'd pay 11 three quarters percent 
Uh, so twelve thousand pounds. That would be uh, one thousand two hundred plus one hundred twenty, one thousand three hundred twenty plus nine. The three quarters of one hundred twenty. That's ninety. That'd be paying one thousand four hundred ten pounds a year in interest. Plus, I had a twenty-five year loan. I guess it was. Uh, so that would be another four hundred eighty pounds on twelve thousand um, pounds. So I was probably paying 1,480 plus 1,410, that'd be about 1,890, uh, which would be about 40% of my 4,800 pound salary. Um, and I think a lot of people nowadays have uh, were borrowing when it was costing them maybe 30% of their salary. But of course, with the rise in interest rates, uh, it's going to cost them, in some cases, 60, in some cases, 90% of their salary to service their mortgage. So it's going to be a lot harder on people than it was for me back then. Um, and I did suffer, after I bought it, I did suffer a, an interest rate rise. I think rates moved up on my mortgage to about 15% at their peak, um, and which is about what I said. But house prices were still going up, despite the rise in interest rates. But it didn't affect me nearly as much as it's going to affect people today, they will suffer a lot more today. And the reason for that was we had very high inflation, much higher than we see today, which meant that your your, your salary was going up all the time. So your principal payments were staying constant, but your salary was going up, which meant you had, at the end of the day, more money in your pocket, even after allowing for a rise in interest rates. Uh, but we didn't have, as I said, with our rise in interest was more like 30%. It wasn't like we're having today of 100% or 200%. Um, so it was much more bearable back then. Uh, but, you know, I was conscious of how hard it was going to potentially be because we could see higher inflation rate coming. Uh, there was a lot of the newspapers about higher interest rates. So I prepared myself for the worst. I took a second job. I was working a, a nighttime job, which earned me another um 1200 something like that a year um i i let my girlfriend move in um, i didn't charge her rent but uh, she was contributing by buying the food and things like that we didn't have tv couldn't afford one didn't drink much beer or eat much meat uh back then for uh, you know, it was it was quite tight um and of course we couldn't spend money on netflix or iphones or the the frivolities of today yeah. Um, so it, it was a lot tighter, but uh, people, was doable. people, I think, are, they're going to go back to that. They're going to have yeah. to tighten their belts a lot. They're, people are going to have to take in lodgers, I think. That, that, I, yeah. I don't know what people will do, because otherwise they'll lose their houses, and I'm very sad for them. Yeah, and the other thing, though, Clive, back then you said the rate was just above 11%, wasn't it? And then... It, yeah, 11.35, 11 yeah. 11 the, the thing is that now, though, they, they, the, and I think the central banks are, are to blame for this. Um, they kept rates like below 1% uh, for like 13 years. So, and, and then they came in 2020, uh, like the Bank of England doubled their balance sheet in 2020, 21, and they cut rates to like 0 0.1. Uh, the uh, Chancellor, um, which was Rishi Sunak during that period, he he paid uh, everyone to stay at home. And then he cut the stamp, like had the stamp duty holiday, encouraged everyone to, to borrow and, and buy a house. And now everything's unraveling. So uh, I saw that the two-year guilt yield at one point was negative. So the fact that it's at five, it means that it's it's gone infinitely up. But back when interest rates were 11 percent in the late 70s, they couldn't infinitely go up. They'd go up maybe to 15, uh, which is manageable in, in real terms. But now, <laughs> you know, people are getting mortgages for 2 percent. I, I could see it at 9, 10 percent in the next 18 months. And, and, and uh, people are going to suffer more than I think uh, than you probably did back then. Yeah, I mean, going from 11% to 15%, a 4% increase is far less than going from 2% to 7% or, or 6%, because um, that 2% 2, 2 to 6% is a tripling of the of the outgoings, uh, whereas my outgoings were going from 11 to 15 well, that's uh, perhaps only 4% up, 40% up. Mm, yeah. Um, could you... Uh... Some uh, Graham Hobbs, he's one of the long-term followers. He he says, I know I don't know nothing much about bonds, 
but the fact that the title has government in it is a big clue. <laughs> so could you explain to the viewers how bonds work? I mean, yep. I, I've made many videos about it, but maybe get your opinion on it. Uh, make it s simple so that people can understand it and why why uh, rising bond price, rising yields, especially very quickly, uh, how they can be uh, really bad for the cap, your capital, especially if it's in longer term bonds. So let's go back 10 years ago uh, to about 2012, when interest rates were probably less than 1%. And the government needs to raise money. So it uh, borrows money. And it let's say it borrows for 20 years at 1% a year. So it issues a bond. Uh, let's call it a hundred pound bond for simplicity issued a hundred pound bond, which promises to pay whoever takes that bond 1% a year. So every year they're going to get one pound for, from now for the entire 20 years. That one pound interest will not go up, nor will it go down. And in 20 years time, the lender will get his hundred pounds back. That's, that's a hundred pound bond. But along the life of the bond, the short term rates or the rates of interest in the market are going to change. At the time the bond was issued, the rate was 1%. But if the rate is now 10%, the next investor is thinking, well, I'm not going to invest in a, pound, a bond yielding only 1%. It's not worth it. I can buy another one yielding 10%. I can get 10% for the next 20 years. Uh, that's I'll earn 200 pounds instead of 10 pounds, instead of 10 pounds, or yeah, instead of pounds. So the, what happens to the first bond with the low interest rate is the price will fall. So the investor who bought that one pound bond, that 100 pound bonds with a 1% interest rate will find his bond is now trading at perhaps 20 or 30% with a big loss. Um, obviously, at some point, it will mature after the, when it, in 20 years time, when it finally reaches maturity, it's going to mature at the price of 100. Uh, and it will gradually rise towards that 100. But if he wants to sell it in between time, he's going to realize his loss. And this is why we've had a few bankruptcies in America, and we're probably going to see a few more, because many of the banks uh, which did go bust had bought US government bonds, which had long maturities. And as interest rates rose, those bond prices fell. And then depositors of those banks said, you're not paying me enough. I'm getting half a percent in the bank, but I could buy a government bond or I can put it in a money market fund and get four or five percent. So investors started to withdraw the money from the banks to invest in better yielding bonds, which meant the banks had to raise cash and they were forced to sell these bonds, crystallizing the losses. And that's how they whacked out their capital by selling bonds at a loss. Uh, you sounds off, Mario. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to turn something off here. Uh, no, and I think that uh, the right time to have bought bonds were actually when they were yielding zero. Not, no, sorry, not yielding zero, not the right time to buy. The right time to buy was probably 30 years ago or 20 years ago. But now I think it's just the, the wrong thing to do. And I'm afraid a lot of people are going to get burnt. But, you know, I personally don't buy government bonds, uh, Graham. <laughs> I don't want to finance the government because that's what you're doing when you do do that. And uh, but if you are want to put it in guilt, I would put it more in the one month. Uh, if you can get one month or three month bills, they're called bills uh, because let's say they're five percent and then rates go to seven percent. In you can always uh, reinvest that, but and even the two-year guilt, you might buy it now and get five percent. Maybe in two years' time, rates will be eight uh, percent. You've lost out, but your your principal hasn't been really been lost too much. And um, yeah, um, there's so, a term, Clive. So, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. The, the time to buy bonds is when the interest rate you're going to receive is well in excess of the inflation rate, which is expected in the future. Uh, I don't think we're there yet, uh, unless you happen to believe the government's promise of 2% inflation. Now, if you believe the government's 2% inflation, then a bond yielding 5% isn't a bad deal. Uh, yeah. But I don't believe that. I think the inflation yeah. is going to be very persistent. I don't think it will stick around at 2%. I think it will be somewhat higher. Um, it could go 
a lot higher. Uh, so I wouldn't be buying bonds yielding 5%. But if we see the kind of yields we saw back in the early 80s, uh, I remember I started a job at one point in the early 80s, and my boss said to me, uh, now's the time to buy bonds. And he showed me some government bonds. You could get 16 to 17% on UK government bonds. And I went down to the post office and bought myself uh, across the counter. You could buy in the, over the counter then some of those. Um, unfortunately, when the yields started to come down, I thought, what a good profit, because the bond, as yields come down, the price goes up and I sold them. Uh, but I sold them a decade too early with hindsight. Yeah. Uh, but certainly uh, at that time, uh, the bond yield was had had moved well above the rate of inflation it was a good buy with hindsight yeah i think we're way too early for that personally i think you know the um central banks the governments wall street the city of london they've all been wrong they've been first they thought i i, I was uh listening to one of my old videos where i talked about how the uh the government and the bank of england have tinkered with the cpi and at that time, I think it was 2021, I said, well, uh, the Bank of England governor just said that CPI might go above 3%, but it's all going to be transitory. <laughs> and then we're going to go back to our target of 2%. That was in 2021. And here we are in 2023. It's still more, more like 10%. So... Uh, I think we've, we've had wage, wage inflation, so people are being paid more. That will feed through to the cost of goods. So the oh, goods yeah. are not going down at the moment. Yeah. Well, actually, it's, I don't like calling it wage inflation. I, I, I like to say that uh, workers just uh, they demanded more because the currency is worth less. But you're right; it's going to create a like a snowball effect, uh, and uh, people are going to keep. Uh, getting rid of their currency much quicker and buying more things and all the COVID uh, stuff, also the restrictions and lockdown, that's uh, disrupted the supply chain, it's disrupted people going to work. And I think there's a lot of people that are on benefits as well, that it doesn't pay for them to go back to work. So we might see uh, the CPI drop a little bit and they say, oh, we have the inflation, it's only 5% now. But eventually, it will go back up, in my opinion. And uh, like in the 70s, we saw, like uh, I think, inflation uh, topped in the mid-70s. And people probably at the time thought, oh, this is it. It's finished. But then it went up with a vengeance towards the early 80s. And I think uh, Jim Sinclair, who's like uh, made a fortune trading gold in the 70s, he was called Mr. Gold. He, uh, in 1980 or 81, when the 10 year yield went to 15 and a half percent, he sold all his gold and, and bought treasuries. So, but I, I think we're still far away from there. Uh, I think it will be more in the crisis, maybe in two, three years or something, or maybe more. And then the Bank of England will have to raise rates like two, three, three percent above the. I, I don't even think CPI, you're going to have to look at RPI because that's a, that's even higher. But we've got a couple of uh, super chats here, uh, Clive. Uh, Silver uh, Dagen Club, what do you think of the drain the mint? Or would you like to talk to us about this in, in an interview? Uh, I guess drain the mint is like a, this new hashtag in the US they, they, to, to buy physical silver, uh, I think, because the US mint, uh, they, they've been hanging... Um, on they're not minting enough uh coins it seems uh bullion coins and uh there's a huge demand uh, i mean draining the mint or draining uh physical i've always said that even before the silver squeeze movement uh, back in uh 2021 i've been telling people on this channel all the time if you're gonna buy gold and silver uh, if you're not investing in mining, you should buy physical because the ETFs are controlled by the bankers. And uh, uh, when push comes to shove and there's a crisis, you won't you won't get anything. You won't be able to get your gold and silver. Uh, Clive, what, what are your thoughts? Um, I think at the moment it's quite a good time to be accumulating silver and gold slowly. Um, they are two different things, so uh, I don't exactly put them in the same pot but i think both have got a, a it's an interesting period i think you've got time um we've seen uh 
strong words from the Federal Reserve, ECB and Bank of England about inflation. Um, I think there's a new level of determination appeared in the last few weeks to fight inflation by being very aggressive in interest rates. Um, in America, the um, uh, Mr. Powell has said he wouldn't be surprised if we have at least two more rate rises. Uh, so some people are saying, well, it will be at least two, could be four. Um, and the half a percent move recently by the Bank of England uh, also shows a determination to be quite aggressive with interest rates. Now, higher interest rates are negative, a negative for gold and silver, uh, at least in the short run. And that's giving a, a window of opportunity for people to pick up gold and silver while it's cheap. Uh, because at some point um, those rate rises will stop and then uh, people will start to look at the government debt situation and the finances of the state and the inflation rate and gold and silver should come into their own. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to see a large rise in the coming days or weeks, but we do see one interesting factor, and that is the draining of the uh, deliverable silver at COMEX. Uh, I don't have the numbers. I've seen the headlines saying it's getting lower, less and less. Someone's taking it. They don't know where it's going. Could be going to China. Could be going to Russia. Who knows? Um, but anyway, someone seems to be taking the gold and silver out of COMEX. So if we get to a sudden point where suddenly the manufacturers can't lay their hands on silver, which is obviously a, a, an industrial metal in a certain sense, uh, then we could see silver fly. My my betting is that silver will be the first to fly, and I think gold will make its way upwards slowly. Um, but I again, it's, uh, it, it's always going to be a two-way thing, and it'll be very heavily influenced by, one, the level of the dollar relative to other currencies, and by interest rates, which an interest rates in turn influence the level of dollars so if mr powell comes out and raises interest rates in july as is currently expected and makes it sound as though there could be more rate rises beyond that um that will keep the pressure on the gold and silver price giving people a longer opportunity to buy cheaply uh, i would take advantage of this period uh you don't need to panic but uh i wouldn't wouldn't delay either i think i would uh for those who are interested in it um suddenly it's a good time to be buying now yeah, and uh, uh, historically, if you look back at the 70s, interest rates, I think, in the early 70s were like 4 or 5 percent, and then uh, they went up all the way to like 20 percent in 1980, and gold went from $35 an ounce to almost 900 and why, how did that happen? Well, because most of the time, the central banks, they, they were like uh, not really raising rates enough to quell the inflation. And I think uh, it's going to be even worse now because they're not really being honest about the debasement. Uh, you know, their CPI numbers are, are doctored as we saw earlier. And the other thing is uh, financial repression, which maybe you can co cover before we look at uh, this super chat here from Chris Conman. Uh, thank you, Chris. If the BRICS announce a new gold back currency in their upcoming august meeting how will that affect the dollar thanks um i'll let you answer that clive and then maybe you could talk about the the uh, financial repression as well if i genuinely believe that the BRICS gold back currency will be really redeemable into gold i will be buying it i don't think i'm going to be believing it for a long long time uh, but, you know, if we get some sort of world peace and Russia's not in a war and uh, people are actually physically redeeming their currency for gold, uh, yeah, that could be very interesting. But that's going to take a long time. So even if they bring in a gold back currency next month or next year, um, I don't think it's going to get uh, huge traction uh, because people aren't going to trust the counterparties for a while. Um, but once we start to get to a situation where you can take in your BRICS gold back currency and get some gold for it then uh yeah it might start to get traction but that'll take take time so i won't be buying it on day one i'll keep my eye on it but i'd rather own the physical gold personally i think that's uh much more certain it's it's um you know how they say about bitcoin not your not your not your keys not your coin well it's the same thing for for gold i can say if it's not your coin in your hand it's not your gold that's right and uh 
Yeah, financial repression. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, financial repression. Uh, and that happened uh, actually in the UK and also in the US during World War II and after World War, War II. And what is financial repression? Well, it's when the the central bank and the governments deliberately inflate the system and, and keep uh, interest rates uh, below the rate of inflation in order to make the debt more manageable because it writes off the debt. That's how they do it. And I think that's the policy that we have now. Of course, we don't hear Sunak or Hunt or or the the Fed or or Yellen saying our policy is a financial repression to write off the debt. We're going to, you know, a short change savers uh, because we're not really being honest about CPI and interest rates are too low. But I think that's what they want to do. And that's why I think Clive is right about uh, accumul accumulating gold and silver because uh, they they can't carry the debt uh, <laughs> un unless they keep uh, policy still accommodative. Yeah, well, it's for, for decades, it's been the plan of governments, it's been the action of governments to try and inflate the away the debt, reduce the value of the debt to GDP by having the GDP grow, uh, grow at least at the pace that their debt is growing. But w where we've got to in some countries, and I can't tell you the UK numbers, because I haven't studied them enough. But if I look at the USA, the official plan of the USA, as we stand in 2023, is for the debt to GDP ratio to go up and up and up and all the way to 200%. That's the official number. Uh, doesn't take into account the unfunded liabilities, which would push it to 400%. Um, they, they're looking for the debt to GDP ratio to go up and up. So basically, the, 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 pl the plan is to spend and have no financial stability in terms of balancing the budget ever again. Now, that's a complete turnaround from the budget they had in 2012, which which was a long-term budget going out many, many years, which saw that the debt-to-GDP ratio would go down, and eventually uh, the, balance, the the budget would be uh, almost, bal well, would be balancing, but the, the level of debt-to-GDP would drop into around 30%. Now, that 30%, the target for that 30 has moved to 90 uh, well, that's that was the the thirty percent target was for this year. We're actually at ninety something. Uh, that's uh, debt owned by the public versus GDP, and it's set to according to their own numbers, it's set to go to two hundred percent in a few decades. Uh, so they've done away with the plans for prudence. No, I, I think in the UK uh, the numbers are a bit not as transparent. Apparently, uh, we just went over a hundred percent of GDP in the debt the first time since World War II or something. But that's, I, I think they don't count all, all the debt that they had to take to bail out the banks in 08. So I think it's a lot higher and it's not gonna get better. The other thing about uh, the 50s and 60s is that um, the economies were growing and uh, government wasn't as big as uh, it is now. Yes, government got big during the war because it had to, take over the economy but now uh the the private sector is being crowded out and, and we don't see gdp anymore <laughs> above three percent i mean it's regularly now below two or even one so they're gonna have a tough time growing uh, i see the gdp in the uk is now half a percent uh latest number in may i'm not sure yeah, if I, I thought yeah. I, I thought it was half percent but something very very small that's right. Uh, we've got another super chat here. And then I'm going to go to another article because someone mentioned commercial real estate. Uh, Silver Dagen Club, thank you again for your super chat. The Department of Defense budget uh, that Monaco retweeted today stated the government acknowledges silver shortage and pricing silver at $30. Why is the spot price uh, uh that the government is paying 30 pounds an ounce. Yeah, I retweeted that. Someone put that story, but I, I looked into the documents and that was from 2021. And it might have been when uh, silver was closer to $30 than it is now. But um, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's because the paper price of silver is heavily uh, leaned on, I think. 
And uh, I think a lot of, not just the uh, bullion banks, but even a lot of miners, uh, silver miners, uh, they, because silver is a byproduct of a lot of base metals and they don't really care. They just want to uh, like get their profit. And so I, I think there's a, a lot of that going on. How do you see that, uh, Clive? The amount of silver being mined today um, is less than it was 10 years ago. Um, and over the decade, the amount of silver being consumed for industrial production, that would be things like automotive, uh, photovoltaic and so forth, has been gradually increasing. So about a year or two, two years ago, we crossed, we had the point of crossover where the consumption of silver started to exceed the mined silver. The difference being made up of a mixture of recycling and, of course, and there's also money going to coinage and things like that. Uh, but that's that's where the difference came from. So the expectations, according to the Silver Institute, are that the consumption of silver for industrial use due to the photovoltaic, uh, automotive and electronics will continue to increase and that the mining production will increase. But the mining and production is which is now below the consumption is not expected to increase as fast as consumption. So the difference will have to come out of recycled silver. That is people bringing their candlesticks, the knives and forks, the old coins and things to have them melted down. Uh, and there's a lot of that. Every time the silver price spikes, there are people pop down to the pawn shops or the um, gold and silver vials and sell their precious metals. Uh, so that can carry on for a long time. But to get that extra metal into the system to be consumed by the industrials, you do need to have higher prices. So um, at some point when interest rates stabilize, I think that prices should start to move or, or for silver should start to move higher for the simple reason that consumption is going to be going up faster than uh, they can mine it. And as you say, Mario, most of the silver which is mined is indirectly mined. Uh, as opposed to directly mined. There are some direct silver mines, but uh, for the most part, they're a byproduct of other metals. Yeah. So uh, I want to share this uh, because I think it was Lord Humongous who was one of the moderators. Thank you, Lord Humongous, for being a moderator. And he mentioned the uh, commercial real estate. And I saw this article, I think it's from, uh, well, it was from uh, today from this weekend it says financial storm bears down on u.s commercial real estate long-awaited reckoning arrives as building loans come due at a time of scarcer credit so uh have you been following a little bit this and uh, the fact as well i think a lot of the u.s regional banks they own i think 60 to 70 percent of these commercial real estate loans um absolutely now we a little bit earlier, I was talking about when interest rates rise, the value of bonds fall. But it's not just bonds which fall in price. It's the value of all assets which fall in price when interest rates rise, particularly the kinds of assets which have a, a yield. So a real estate loan is a loan for the long term by a bank. And it's perfectly obvious that as interest rates rise, the value of that cash flow from the loan, which is often at a fixed rate, is going to be good is going to be worth less therefore the value of the real estate loan is is worth less um i doubt they're booking or marking to market the value of those real estate loans as they fall in price uh, they will do slowly over the next few years but they don't want to rush it otherwise it's going to make another banking crisis at the same time we will have landlords who bought property five six seven eight nine ten years ago uh with a level a certain uh, rental agreement which might last for five or ten or fifteen years uh, at that least, and at the same time they'll have borrowed money from a bank for three or five years fixed. Two things are going on. First of all, when that loan matures, they won't be able to roll it over at the same rate as they got five or seven years ago. That the rate of interest is now five percent higher, give or take. It might be a little bit more than that, depending on uh, how things go. That changes the mathematics of their operation because the rent, if 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 the interest is going up by two or three times at two or three hundred percent, the rent they're receiving when the lease matures will not be rising by two or three hundred percent. 
in, and in fact, if it's office buildings, it's likely that the rent they'll get will be less because landlords will be saying we don't need so many uh, so many floors or so much space anymore. So they'll probably be getting less rent on the office block. Uh, and that doesn't just affect office blocks. It affects all the businesses around the, the center of town, the, you know, the, 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 the sandwich shops and any uh, uh, the, the luxury shops, anything which is near to the center of town and benefiting from those office blocks will be suffering from uh, lower footfall and therefore their rents will be lower. And when, when the value of commercial real estate in one area is falling, it has a knock-on effect everywhere because people are going to look at what they could do with their money and they're not going to buy the highest priced real estate. So I think we're, we're looking at across the board a fall in the value of real estate. And we've seen a few examples of sales which have been quoted in the newspapers where the prices have gone down by 30 35%. I think realistically speaking on commercial real estate, uh, related to office blocks, we're looking at more than 50. Um, <clears throat> in certain cases, it could be as much as 100% reduction. There was total wipeout. Um, but I think everywhere else, a 30% reduction in commercial real estate prices wouldn't be surprising given the rise in interest rates we've seen. We've seen. Yeah, so I guess uh, property prices, they, they, they act just like a bond. Uh, they're, uh, you know, they're backed, they're backed by, uh, by uh, a building, but, uh, you know, government bond is backed by the government's power to tax. So, I mean, looking back, for example, at Japan in the 80s, they had a huge bubble. Uh, I remember uh, in the 80s, uh, they valued the uh, uh, Japan, the Imperial Palace in Tokyo more than <laughs> the whole real estate of California. And then we had the bust in 89. And uh, a lot of uh, real estate, a lot of properties went down 80 to 90 percent. And I think we've had uh, the huge, the biggest bubble now, you know, ever since 0809. So yeah, 30% is, in my opinion, for commercial real estate, very realistic, and it's going to hurt the banks. And I read an article that the reason why Powell paused, uh, it was a, a hawkish pause, it was for a month, is to give the banks a little bit of leeway, because a lot of um, a lot of banks are not getting deposits because people are buying treasuries. They get four or five percent. The banks can't pay that much because they've made really bad investments. So they can't, you know, like Nat West, their savings uh, is one point one percent, and I, I'm sure they bought a lot of uh, bonds and they're not doing well. So they can't pay me uh, three or four percent. And uh, I remember back in the uh, '90s. Uh, you, they had very good rates for savings because the banks weren't as leveraged. You know, if interest rates were at six, you probably get six, uh, get four, four percent on the savings account. But now they're at five, and I'm getting one point one. So um, that's what's well, going on there. There's a lot has changed in the banking sector. I mean, uh, when I bought my first flat back in the seventies, um, it was the building societies, not the banks. And they had a very good scheme. Um, you had to be, a, with the building society, you had to be a saver for at least three years and have committed over those three years to pay at a fixed regular amount, which you could increase, but you weren't supposed to in decrease or you'd lose your interest. But if you could pay in for three years nonstop, you more or less qualified yourself for a mortgage. So there was a huge incentive for people to keep paying in I mean, now the interest rates to do them justice were very good. In fact, they were, they, you got the highest rate for paying in regularly. Um, so it, it was quite motivating. But even if it hadn't been the highest interest rate, people would have kept paying in to qualify themselves for a mortgage. Now that's gone. And the other thing you could get in the 1970s was if you went to a building society, they would offer you the ability to put your money away for one, two, three, four, five years, uh, where you would get a fixed rate of interest. But the, the good thing was the building society had your money so they knew, knew where they stood in terms of when you're going to ask for it back. You couldn't just walk into the bank as you can today and say, I'll have all my money. Now, that might come back again uh, now the interest rates are higher, but uh, that's what's gone wrong in the last decade. 
all these special offers of one year fixed, two years fixed, five year fixed, uh, regular pay in schemes, they all vanish when the interest rate went to zero because nobody can see any motivation for putting their money away for the long term. Yeah, and, and it seems to me like what you mentioned there is really interesting because back then people actually were encouraged to save and the interest rate encouraged them to save. And from then, you know, you could borrow if you had it enough to save. But nowadays it seems like, no, you know, there's a guy called Martin Lewis. He's supposed to be a money saving expert, but all he seems to be trying to do is save people who got up here with their mortgages and he never talks about the fact that maybe you should save and put something aside to buy a house but the reason people haven't done that is because they've kept rates so low it hasn't encouraged savings and when yeah so we've had net real negative uh uh rates and, and it's killed uh, saving and, and people uh, the Keynes don't seem to realize that to have a growing uh, market economy, you need savings. It, it can't just all be borrowed money and credit. And hopefully we'll uh, go back to, uh, I mean, we're going back to some kind of uh, more savings environment. And uh, But at the same time, I think they're going to keep trying to, to keep the housing market, at least here, elevated and keep people on, on the uh, hamster wheel. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the the other thing I'd say to the very unfortunate borrowers who are now worried that their mortgage payments are going to be unsupportable is you have to think and see if there are other things you can do to get yourself back on an even keel. I mean, maybe they can take in lodgers, maybe they can get, get a, side, a side gig. Um, for example, I know a girl here who's buying the wax for candles uh, costs her about two francs and she's selling them to shops who then resell them for special events. Uh, and But she's getting 10 times her money on every one she sells. Uh, I don't know how much she's making, but people people can find side gigs if they are willing to put the effort in. Um, uh, as I said, when I took my first flat, I had two jobs. I was working uh, eight hours a day in the city of London, seven hours a day in the city of London. And then I worked for four hours in the night in a, uh, I, well, actually I became a, a bingo caller in a, in a bingo chain. Uh, yeah. And that was se seven days a week, um, which was extra money. And, but it provided me the buffer, which gave me the reassurance that if they did put the rates up, I'd be able to afford it. Yeah. My wife, uh, she, uh, she got her first job in the city, um, when she was 18 or 19, I mean, she did her A-levels, but uh, she, she decided to uh, go go to work. And uh, she got a job at the Fuji Bank. And then she got a job at, at Baring Securities, which was the broke securities part of Baring's bank. But she said she, in the beginning, she still had a job at, uh, at night in, in the pub where she lived to supplement her income but eventually she did very well didn't have to do that job you know people are gonna have to think uh more yeah you have to do what it takes and i'm afraid a lot of people uh, nowadays have uh that mentality is kind of gone out the window a little bit but i still do i think uh, a lot of young people will do that we can't really underestimate them uh yeah you can't we can't just like uh generalize yeah some people will make tough choices they'll give up things they like and want and think they're entitled to but there will be those who think that they can't give up with their little treats in life and uh can't make sacrifices um i i feel very sorry for the people because everybody everybody is literally going to feel hard done by by these right re interest rate rises and it's going to create a lot of resentment um, against the government or the Bank of England. I mean, I, it, obviously, it's the Bank of England which has raised the rates. Um, I'm not blaming them. I think probably if I was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, I'd be doing the same thing. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, people are going to hate it. They're going to say, he's costing you money. And they're going to, people, those who can't afford it might go to their boss and say, can I have a pay rise? It could be inflationary too. Uh, we mustn't forget that part of the cost of manufacturing is in fact the interest rate component because companies have to borrow money to build factories um so if it's going to cost them more they'll be factoring that into the price of goods and services that they sell
Yeah, that, and I think that's probably what happened in the 70s as well as they raised interest rates things got even worse uh, in terms of price uh and uh I, I mean this is one thing here that i think governments are not ready to do even though they're t talking tough i think back in may uh the uh, budget deficit in the uk was the second highest on record <laughs> so the bis which i don't respect much either the bank for international settlements they're saying now cut public spending or boost taxes to tackle inflation. So they're basically saying it's not just the central banks that need to uh, get get on the job, but also governments. But I, I just uh, don't see this happening, uh, you know, uh, cutting public spending. Uh, and, and I mean, taxes already in the UK are at the highest levels since just after the war. Um once you raise taxes beyond a certain point it becomes a big disincentive for people to do business so international investors who are thinking of coming to the uk are going to look at the tax rate they'll have to pay they're going to look at the growth in gdp which i just brought it up actually i see last quarter uh G uk gp was 0.1 percent the quarter before that was 0.1 percent uh, so the gdp growth in uk is very low that's not encouraging if you're coming to the uk to do business um, and if you've got to pay 40% or more taxes, that's not very encouraging because uh, there are plenty of places you can go and do business. Uh, not all businesses, but there are many businesses you could be very mobile where you where you are. And don't forget, many of the businesses these days are mobile businesses. Uh, you know, it's, it's pushing pushing paper around and pushing paper around can be pushed around on a computer wherever you are in the world. You don't have to be in a specific, specific location. Uh, so it will be counterproductive to raise taxes um, on the other hand, governments have shown very little willingness to cut spending. Of course, they have fights between the left and the right uh, about um, whether wh wh which sort of spending should be cut. Uh, but the end result is they do battle with each other and then they get reach a compromise. And the compromise is always that they both get the extra spending. Yeah, and someone, uh, because you spoke earlier about if silver pops up, maybe people will sell some of their silver to pawn shops. And and someone said, oh, Mario, maybe it's time for you to open another pawn shop because I don't know if you know, I I started a, a, a franchise back in 2012. But I would say I would, uh, I'm glad I'm out of that business. Not that I didn't like it, but the fact that uh, there's so much uh, red tape. There's uh, something called business rates here in the UK. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, the local council ch charges you depending where you are, but they can charge you as much as eight or 10,000 pounds a year just to have a shop. And, and then when you start doing a lot of business, you have to start paying VAT. And, and even the banks, you know, if you get a, uh, because I, I opened a limited company, so I had to have a business account with Barclays. And they were just charging me like 200 pounds every quarter just for having an account. <laughs> and uh, there's so many costs. And I, so no, I, I wouldn't get back in that business. I'm happy doing what I do here on YouTube now and other and the other ancillary businesses. And my overhead is, well, it's my home, which is paid for. So there you but go. But it's good to go up if you've got a mortgage barrier. I don't. I don't know. The last time we, we sold our house in 2015, we moved into a house that's a little smaller, but it's in a different area, not as expensive as the other one. So uh, I was able to pay off by this without a mortgage. So I don't have that. But we do have other bills that are, have been going up. And uh, so you have to to keep, a, you know, uh, I, I guess the council council tax is like a, a mortgage and that that keeps going up every year. Um, I think for the benefit of our international viewers, Maria, we should say something about UK mortgages and how they differ from those in, let's say, America. Yeah. Now, in America, when you take out a mortgage, it's a 20 year mortgage and your, int your interest rate um, will be fixed for a long time. Uh, that's what that's uh, so that's why the central bank is insolvent now because they own a lot of um uh collateral uh, mortgage bonds and 
the, the banks are in trouble because they've lent money long term. But in the UK, it's different. When you take out a mortgage in the UK, you might get a fixed rate of mortgage for three, four or five years. But after that deal is over, you go on to the floating rate and your interest rate will move around with free market rates. So where we are in the UK is over the course of the next four years or so, all of the remaining fixed rate mortgages, which will for the most part, not be more than five years when they are granted, will gradually reach maturity. And those people who had a loan at, so let's say, 2% will then have to renew it at whatever the market rate is, uh, which I think today would be probably 7% for a mortgage in the UK. I, I don't know if you know what it is currently, Mario. The I think the uh, two-year uh, mortgage now is uh, just over 6%. And I think the five-year might be about 5.7 um only because the five-year swaps or guilt yields are a bit lower but yeah like you said uh you can do a deal for 30 years where you pay off um uh, you know you i think a lot of people are extending it to 35 years because it makes their repayments smaller but in, like in the u.s though in the u.s you can fix your your rate for 30 years but here like you said I think the most they'll do is 10 years and most people do it two or five years. And, and a lot of people have gotten into the uh, false sense of security that if they fix it for two years, then maybe uh, in two years time it will be lower so they can refix it again. But I, I, I think this time it's going to be a lot higher. And I think there's 1.4 million mortgages to be renewed this year alone. And a lot of them were taken out in 2021 when they pushed, you know, rates really low. Uh, when I had a mortgage, though, I actually um, was able to have two mortgages. Not that I took on a big mortgage, but I split it into two. I had one that was uh, fixed and the other one floating. So you could try to do that as well. Many people don't think of that. They just do one deal. Uh, but you, you could have uh, one fixed, one floating. Yeah, here in Switzerland, uh, you could take out mortgages uh, typically with a fixed rate of interest for well, up to 20 years, although most people don't have a fixed year for that long. Uh, of course, if you repay it early, you could have some sort of penalty. Um, but uh, what I what I thought was a good idea for myself, I took out mortgage, uh, you could, I split my mortgage into five or six tranches where you could have one part live or one part two years, three years, four years, five years, and six years. Mm. Uh, and what that meant was that every year, one of my tranches fixed rate, fixed rate chance would mature. And then I could roll it over for another five or six years at a fixed rate. The advantage of that is that as interest rates change, my outgoings will change very gradually because only one fifth or one sixth of what I owe will mature each year and uh so i i think if you're in the uk and you have that option to stagger your mortgage um maybe it's worth looking at whether you can get a bank to lend you some for three years some for five years some for seven years and some for 10 years fixed um and that way it gives you a little bit of, uh, more of stability uh unlike the people who've had all of the 100 of their mortgage which is going to mature this year and they're going to have that huge leap in outgoings which is very very hard for these people to manage and uh we we've seen the government uh th this week now i think it was thursday or friday because uh, i think the two-year guilt yield now closed at 523 on friday and I remember talking about it a few weeks ago when it was around 4.4. And I was saying this is not looking good. But now uh, Jeremy Hunt, the chancellor, said he's spoken to banks and uh, that they're they're going to like help people not not foreclose on them, have a 12 month grace period. Do you think that's going to work? I mean, well, if that was yeah. so easy to do, we'd never have these crises. Uh, I, I read that and I, I just laughed all, all over the place. All the <laughs> banks have all the banks have agreed to do is what they've always done. Uh, you know, it was like they, they've agreed not to foreclose on people in the first six weeks and things like that. Well, if a, if somebody doesn't pay their mortgage, the bank doesn't 
foreclosed on you. The bank talks to you and says, well, what, what are you doing? Are you going to get another job? Are you, uh, have you got a second, get ticket a lodger? How are you going to sort this out? So you've got to, what the banks have now agreed is they won't kick people out for a year. But in simple terms, they wouldn't have done anyway. They're going to try and work with those people for every possible way. The, sec- yeah. the second thing is they, the Chancellor has agreed with the sorry. banks. Like, sorry. So it just looks like uh, they're just uh, coming out with this just to pretend that they're doing something, even though yeah. they're not. It, it's just it's just words from the banks and the Chancellor. Uh, they've agreed to do nothing other than what they always used to do and, and will continue doing. Not harass- Of course, they're going to ask for their money back if you don't pay, but uh, they're not going to kick you out of your house in the first three months or anything like that. That never happened. Yeah, uh, Intrepid Soul, thank you for your super chat. Clive, we're going to wrap up uh, soon. Just wanted to ask one final question. Uh, and this is more for the UK viewers. It could apply elsewhere. Where, what do you think is going to happen to UK house prices in the next, let's say, two years? Um, I did the maths on this. I think that where we stand now, we ought to be about 15% below the peak. Uh, we're currently, I think, uh, much less than that below the peak. It's 5 or 6 or 7% below the peak. Um, so I think there's a little bit of way to go. We could probably see another 7% off the peak based on the latest interest rate rise. But if we have further interest rate rises in the UK, which I think is a likelihood, um, then I think it's highly probable that that 15% off will go to perhaps 20% off the peak. Uh, So I would say uh, people need to be braced for another 10% down. All right, great. Uh, Clive, thank you very much for coming on the uh, live stream. And I'd also like to thank thank all the viewers for your interest and your questions. Uh, Hopefully, uh, yeah, it's difficult sometimes to answer all the questions, but Hopefully we, uh, uh, yeah, we we answered enough. Great. Thank all you right. very much, Maria. Uh, thanks very much to all your viewers for being here and for the lovely comments. Uh, okay, great. And I think someone said, oh, uh, you did a bingo uh, caller. I think you'd be good also at the darts. You know, you'd go 180. <laughs> oh, yeah. you know you know why they employed me i was i was working in the east end of london which back then was a very rough and dangerous area it was later later stone and walthamstow three halls i was doing the, the the tour and they employed me because i was a posh essex boy with a plummy <laughs> accent and they couldn't trust the locals so they had to get someone from out of town to, right. to do okay. it great 